morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Okay. So um, today's session is basically a follow-up on session one about um, the post viral load. And um, so we're going to talk about enhanced adherence uh, support and common barriers and approaches to um, this barriers. So, so I just want to remove, something. yeah, great. So let's look at um, the first slide. So if you can look at this, um, the HIV care continuum that we all thought was an issue was or was the picture when we started to the program, right? We always thought it was a straightforward, straightforward linear kind of care continuum where person gets diagnosed with HIV, linked to care, starts treatment and achieves viral suppression, right? So, but if you look at this picture, there's a couple of things that now we know are not the um accurate at the moment. So it assumes that adherence to treatment is, is straightforward. You take treatment every day once you're diagnosed and you viral suppress. And it also oversimplifies the complex cycle of engagement and re-engagement by um by people experienced by people living with HIV. Great. And if you look at this, it's not just um, a picture for the HIV continuum. It's a, it's a picture that is um, not as truthful or not as accurate for any for anything that happens with that. Life is not as straightforward as um, as it looks like for anyone, really. So this is the actual picture that is um, that we currently see with our patients. So this is a revolving door to uh, care and adherence to treatment where you start a client on, on, on treatment and they might or not, they might or might not start on, on actually continuing treatment or actually they might not even go to a clinician to, to start to take that treatment. So this basically shows multiple steps, that linear, um, that linear picture, however, with a lot of revolving disengagement, re-engagement and all, and all of that. So what does this tell us? Basically tells us that HIV care continuum is not as straightforward as we think, and that many people living with HIV start and stop up multiple times over the course of their lives as their circumstances change. So, and they really do experience life changes just like everyone else. So most people who are initiated treatment have been on treatment before. We know that these days it's mostly restarts than, um, than newly initiated. And we definitely need to anticipate and identify barriers to adherence on all patients. So when a client is coming to, to a sick care, we must anticipate that they might disengage at some point because it is normal. And we definitely need to approach multidisciplinary collaborations to address um, adherence barriers when necessary. Great. So. Let's look at the clinician's role in minimizing the frequency and duration of non adherence Because we all know that we, uh, whenever we have a patient who's not adhering, we all most of the time we say refer to refer to case manager, refer to somebody else. But as clinicians, clinicians have a very important role in in um in facilitating adherence or in preventing non adherence rather apart from even uh cancer, right? So let's look at some of them. So if a clinician can make sure that the patient is on an optimal regimen to simplify dosing and reduce side effects. We know TLD is an optimal days, um, regimen. And we now with the new guidelines, it is first line, it is second line, and it also it's also part of um it can be third line. So that's definitely we are going to that direction and we need to make sure that our clinicians and facilitators actually um adopt that. And then clinicians also need to continuously monitor adherence um, to treatment. And, and this includes review results from previous um, viral load assessments. And importantly, they need to explain um, abnormal results to clients and educate them about viral loads really. So, and we need to look at side effects and also refer for EAC and adopt an unjudgmental approach. We always talk about that. And most importantly, identify, they need to identify the way to ad, ad, adherence and address them where possible and link them to resources where they can um, immediately assist. Another important thing is to consider and offer multi-month um, um, 
treatment, right? The guidelines also offer us estimations to, to offer clients multi-month treatment. Even if a patient comes back um, today, let's say they are engaging, we are allowed to give them three months medication. Or if a patient is a viral and suppressed today, we are allowed to give them three months medication. So that is to facilitate adherence. So, and another thing is to ensure communication between facilities where the patient is referred to another facility, aka referral letter, to make sure that when a patient goes to the other side, they don't get um, pushed back from the facility. Okay, so let's look at some of the barriers to adherence that clients can um, experience. So, um, before we even look at the barriers, let's look at how then a clinician can build um, a clinician client relationship. Because in order to unpack the barriers, a patient needs to be able to come back to you and tell you what the, those barriers are. And as a clinician, your, um, your own feelings towards the clients facilitate how the client is going to respond, right? Or how they're going to answer or how they're going to share the information with you. So um, so we need to avoid phrases like defaulter, failing, you're going to die, do you want to die? Why are you not taking treatment, right? Because the moment you tell me that I uh, adopt a, you know, that stance of a student, you are a teacher and I'm just gonna sit down and you know, be go to my little shell. And then allow time for the client to get food and assist. A lot of times clinicians don't have don't make time to get that full history. They look at the value load, they talk to the result, they don't talk to the client. And then um, obviously we need to treat the client with respect and create a safe space for sharing. So um, I'll make an example with this one. I, I once had um, a nurse clinician who we were doing EAC sessions with. She was a pastor's wife. So I'm highlighting the pastor's wife part to tell you like she wasn't drinking, she wasn't smoking, she was, you know. And then we we had this line was police and suppressed. And um the next clinician asks the patient, um, do you drink? The patient says no. And she says, Hi, I will no, why don't you drink? Because she made it so normal to drink. The client was like, Yeah, I drink poo sometimes, you know. So the patient started sharing because she made it okay to drink alcohol, right? So, and I didn't expect that from her because I thought she's this holy, holy person who, you know, who doesn't, but she made it so normal. So irrespective of her beliefs and, and backgrounds, we need to, to create that space for clients. So, and obviously she'll understand you for their situation and avoid criticism. And then, um, adopt effective patient community communication approaches, for example, asking open-ended questions, reflective listening, and so on. So I've just included an example of an open-ended question and communication approach. So one question would be, how do you feel about that team uh, uh, HIV treatment, right? Rather than say, we are going to start doing an HIV treatment now. And then when the patient asks, Answers, then you need to listen carefully without interrupting. Reflect on what they said. Oh, so you think you want to start treatment because of one, two, three, according to what I understand. And then uh, you also probe using open-ended questions. Why do you think, or blah, 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 not just yes, no kind of questions. And then once the, the client has answered those questions, you fill in the knowledge gaps about HIV, right? Maybe talk about some of the benefits of treatment, like um, health benefits of a suppressed viral load, um, the external pickup points and stuff like that. Okay, Natasha is calling me. I don't know what's happening. Sorry, I was trying to give you a two minute warning. That'd be so. so oh, <laughs> okay. So there's no breaks. Okay. Um, Two minute running, but um, uh, just said no. <laughs> great. Okay, um, I'll just finish quickly. So and then yeah, allow them to work through the pros and cons, and you know about then what you've discussed and their reasons. 
So I'm just going to go through the barriers. I'm not going to go through all of them. On the left is the actual barriers, the list of barriers. And on the right is um, suggestions on how to cope uh, for those barriers. So I'm not going to go through all of them. So in terms of knowledge deficits, you just uh, say, can you help me? Tell me the names of your mares and stuff like that, just to cope further. And if the patient, one of the barriers is um, the patient maybe stops treatment because they are feeling better, right? So if you look at feeling better, you can say to the patient, do you take your medication even when you are feeling better? And then they can say no, and you can start doing medication. So I'll go to the next page. So there's a couple of this. I'll go through them. And then children with difficulties, fear of disclosure, and other relationships. So those are the uh, questions that you can go through um, in your own time. Skip this slide. So some of the interventions to address this barriers um, in whose adherence would be either if knowledge deficit, you teach them about um, HIV and you do your group um, counseling and peer support groups and stuff like that. Fine. So for the obviously there's a couple of interventions that's out of our control. If you are a clinician, you can't run a support group and stuff like that. But we can do is to refer the client to that adherence um, club case manager or whoever. And then you can also now help with mentoring the case managers on how to offer quality case management. And um, the congestion, we spoke about to congest the, cl the clinic by enrolling a lot of clients who are eligible to pick up points and making sure that trans transfers are easy. Great, so those are more barriers. Great, in summary, so we know that we've established that changing life circumstances affect adherence and retention in care, and everyone experiences our life circumstances, not just people living with HIV. How many of us have uh, paid our car's license in time? We know, I know, we know, not many of us have done that. So that's adherence. We're not adhering to something, right? So it's normal. So, and the approach taken to improve adherence should be tailored to each person's needs and, and barriers to care. And obviously we need a multidisciplinary approach and um, systemic challenges might take a long time to address. We know that, right? The so clinic waiting mm -hmm. times and all of those, they might take a long time. However, there are many interventions that require simple, small changes, day-to-day -day changes in a patient um, care to minimize the frequency and duration of an adherence. It's like, you know, making sure that the patient is on an effective regimen, giving them multi-month treatment and all of that. I think I'm done. Thank you. Okay, Natasha, I hope I minutes. Yeah, I'm so I'm sorry about that. We're just uh, we're trying to make sure that the session completes with one uh, within one hour, so that people um, are not kept away from their their patients when when we're dealing with the DOH staff. So I'm just trying to model timekeeping for for the district teams. But thank you very much for for the presentation. And just to summarize, I think the key take home messages. Um, from the presentation are that we all know that lifelong ART is, is challenging and, and there will be this sort of revolving door um, experience for some of the patients where they either have repeated interruptions or adherence barriers along the way. So the clinician-client relationship is really important and building those positive relationships is going to be absolutely critical if we can get to the bottom of the adherence challenges. And from uh, Tabi Singh's many slides, you can see just how many different challenges there are. So we need to be able to take a thorough history and then come up with tailored interventions for each inter individual. So I think those are the, the main messages for people to take home. So thanks very much for the presentation and for sharing the slides. Um, we're going to move on to the case presentation now. So if you could stop sharing from your side, Tabi Singh, and then um, I think Louise will share on Ernest's behalf. And Ernest, if you're ready to unmute, unmute and we can uh, go through the case. And then after the case, we'll be asking for questions from the floor um, and learning points from the floor about Ernest's case. Thanks very much. All right, um, afternoon, Dr. Natasha. Um, the case will be presented by Lizzie. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Natasha. Yes, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting our case today of an unsuppressed adult who has been on, on treatment since 2015. 
and is a female of 42 years. And this female came to this facility as a transfer in. So they started the treatment on the 21st of uh, July, 2016. She is uh, not pregnant. And uh, looking at the medical history, she's not a uh, diabetic, but she had pulmonary TB and also epilepsy. So our a client has been treated on, on TB. She completed TB treatment. And the previous art, she was on, he was on TFE and which started on the 25th of, of July, 2016 till 28 uh, April, 2023. And it's regarded then as a virological failure. They then switched uh, the patient to TLT on the 22nd of June, 2023. And uh, our client had uh, uh, several uh, interruptions where in 2017 until 28, about more than five months of uh, interruptions. At, and at one point, they failed to collect the blood at the expected date. She is a single mother, independent and only having one child. And that child was tested and the results were negative. She has no side effects. The CD4, which was taken on the 3rd of uh, August 2016, was 208. So looking at the, the, the viral loads that were taken since 2017, uh, she has about 11 uh, viral loads uh, which were collected. And uh, from 2017 until this year, 2023, that's when she he suppressed. And uh, there is no, there was no intervention. And the case manager started with our client on the 3rd of uh, December, 2021. That's when the patient was enrolled on case management. And from a viral load of 4,000, about 4,000, which was taken on the 25th, of May to uh, 2023. Uh, then after three months, they collected another viral load on the 17th August and the viral load suppressed. So looking at adherence assessment, according to the file, the, the patient never missed any treatment. There's no record of missed dose. And when we checked the pill count, she completed and uh, there was no record as well for not taking all the medication. And uh, looking from the previous year, our client uh, never missed any appointment was adherent and had no adherence issues and no opportunistic infections. The patient took all the medication doses as prescribed, no drug interaction and as well as no resistance. And what was done so far is that the patient was enrolled on EAC and case management on the 3rd of December, 2021, whereby the adherence plan was developed and the client consented and signed because we're using the adherence plan as a consent form to be case managed as well. So on the in July, our patient they did ULEM and the results were positive. 
our patient has been on TB treatment and has completed treatment and outcome is cured. Adherence was and reinforced at every visit by clinicians, while the retention counselor provided comprehensive support, which is face-to-face -face at every visit. Telephonic uh, intervention as well was done two weeks after every visit and a telephone reminder three days before the next visit. Uh, at the moment, our client is virally suppressed. It's now decanted, was decanted in September and now taking the treatment at, at an external pickup point. And that is all that I can say about our client. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lizzie, for that really comprehensive and clear case presentation. It was excellent. Um, I have three points of clarity before I open the floor uh, to questions just about the case. The first one is if you could scroll um, to the past medical history. You said the patient has epilepsy as well. I just want to confirm that that is correct because it's marked as no on the form. Are you able to confirm, Lizzie? Because as you spoke, you said epilepsy, but I don't see it on the form and it might impact on other drugs. Yes, that, yeah, sorry about that. It might, it might be a mistake. Uh, the patient is, was only on pulmonary TB treatment. Okay, so, so no epilepsy. Thanks for clarifying. No epilepsy, and then, no diabetes. Okay, and then the next one is um, if you go down to the ARV history, it says that the TEE finished in April of 2023 um, and the TLD started in June of 2023. Was there a treatment gap for two months there um, or is it just the, the dates because it might affect our assessment of a viral load? According according to the file, there was from April, the the only treatment that we could see from the appointment was on the on in June, on the twenty second. So, I'm not sure as whether there was any interruption of two months, but from the information that we got from the file, was that she completed TFE in in April and then was switched to TLT, which started in, in June. Okay, so there may have been a treatment gap there. Okay, thank you. And then last thing you said, she was in case management from December 2021. So she's been almost two years in case management. Yes, it's, it's been about two, two years in case management without any assessment, no switching no any okay. other interventions uh, other than the intervention that was done by the case manager. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for those just points of clarity. Now I'd like to open it up to the floor for the participants to, to ask Lizzie or Ernest, who I think has also helped with the case, um, questions about what comes to mind in terms of how this lady was managed, her viral load history, her treatment history, any concerns you might have about the current management plan. So um, thanks for the hands raised. I'm going to go with Ninka as a participant first and then Ntabi Singh as the SME second. Let's hear from the floor first. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, now, I think the one thing that stood out from, for me for this case is almost seven years approximately of failure on TE with no um, intervention. I think they said she's been on, if you look at the viral loads, we've got viral loads from 2016 to 2023. That's that's more than a thousand um, while we yeah, are with no regimen intervention. So the question would be, um, we've talked about this before, but once again, especially from 2021, what is the role of clinician working with um, retention counselor in case management to make sure we actually action um, these viral loads other than supporting them with case management. So that was that was interesting for me. And I don't know if Lizzie has more to say in terms of the gap between what clinicians did and what they did in case management. Thank you.
Yes, thanks uh, for that, uh, uh, Nikki. What the gap between the clinician, what the clinician did from the case, what I've identified is that they were just uh, looking at the viral load, but before the, the uh, case manager's intervention, there was no EAC according to the records. They were just uh, writing that adherence reinforced but we don't see any intervention until the, the client was enrolled on case management. So since the, the, the client was enrolled on case management, we have those five viral loops that were taken and she referred for, to them for assessment. There were no assessment that were done until they switched the, the, the client in June. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Go ahead and tell me, sir. Thanks, um, Cecily. Yeah, I think I also wanted to sort of raise the same question and um, concern. And I think based on your answer about the fact that the case manager referred multiple times to a clinician, it talks to our um, a strengthened relationship between our case manager and maybe even our ANOVA mess mentors because sometimes our case managers experience difficulties engaging with clinicians at facility level and no matter how they refer clients nothing is being done so I think the next step would have been tell the ANOVA clinician to now go to talk to clinicians as clinicians and then they can you know, try to push the way forward in this case because clearly there was resistance from facility clinicians. So we need to strengthen that relationship. Thanks, Ntabi Singh. Uh, Ninka, you'll note I just want to give a chance to a couple of other um, people first. I, I just wanted to ask people, if you look at what was written in the adherence box, it says that um, there were no adherence issues. And yet uh, we saw in the treatment history box that she had had five and now it appears six different treatment interruptions and for a total of six years, never virally suppressed. So I just wanted to hear a few thoughts from people um, about what they would think in terms of the likelihood that there were no, um, no adherence um, issues in this client. Uh, I just want to open that to the floor. And whilst people are, are having a think, Nink, I just wanted to ask about the recent CD4. It was reported to be 33, which is very interesting because the viral load was also 33. So I'm a bit worried that there may have been a confusion there between the blood results um, because both the CD4 and the viral load are exactly the same on the same day. So Lizzie, maybe whilst we just wait to hear from other people their thoughts about this lady's adherence and retention journey, you could just double check the file for us. So, so guys, let's let's hear from you. If anyone could put their their hand up, um, Lizzie, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Dr. Natasha. E concerning the CD four, uh, I saw it this morning that what is written there as current results is actually not the CD four. We only had one CD4. It's actually the viral load result. If you can see the, the same date and same copies. So that is a mistake that uh, we made. And we did not see that until today that I saw that it was written on top instead of it uh, mm -hmm. only appearing down there. So there was no mm -hmm. second CD4. but she has not been suppressed for six years. Sorry, Natasha, we Is lost the beginning part of what you said. Can you just repeat the whole thing? Uh, sure, I just, uh, I want to check that this lady's been on treatments um, for, since 2016, she had a baseline CD4 of 208, seven years, no viral suppression, and she has not had a repeat CD4. Is that correct? Lizzie? Yes, Dr. Natasha. Okay, so we can come back to that later in terms of, of how we should be monitoring CD4s, but I still want to return to the floor and ask someone to 
to give their thoughts and their assessment of this viral load table, plus the six interruptions, plus the conclusion that this lady has no adherence challenges. What are people's comments on that, please? This is an interactive learning session, so I'd really like to hear from people. Go ahead, uh, Louise. Thanks, Natasha. Um, Lizzie and Ernest, I was wondering if you could give us reasons behind um, the treatment interruptions. They obviously weren't um, flagged as being an adherence issue. So was there another reason behind the treatment interruption? You know, was the client maybe told by a healthcare worker to stop taking her medicine at those times? Um, or, or why were those treatment interruptions not you know, why did the person not think that it was an adherence issue? Thanks, Dr. Louise. Um, according to the case manager, the adherence issues that uh, we wrote there is uh, after she was enrolled on case management, uh, the the, there were no adherence issues ever since she she's enrolled on case management. It's not the, the history like the previous before she was case management. If we can look at the interruptions where before she can be case managed, but ever since she was enrolled on case management, there were no adherence issues. Uh, though we see that uh, previously she used to interrupt treatment. But ever since she was managed, she was coming to the facility on adhering to our clinic appointments and looking at the pill count as well. She was taking as prescribed and completing. And according to self-report adherence, she reported that she was taking treatment. According to the patient as well, as I was told by the RC, was that the patient was always worried to say, but I do take my treatment very well. What could be the problem? So whenever she came to the facility, she would ask the clinician what could be wrong because she's taking the, the treatment as prescribed, but yet she's not suppressing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, just one comment, and then I want to hear from the floor. I'm going to move on to what people think was happening then if she was adhering, but that viral load was staying high. Go ahead, Louise. Um, so I just want to know then, Lizzie, it sounds, I mean, what you're describing sounds classically like virological failure and drug resistance, which is what I'm, I, I'm reading between the lines, is what the clinician thought was the problem with this lady and why it resolved when she was put onto TLD. But then, as Natasha said, there was a two-month interruption between April and June. So I just want to know why, because that then would have happened while she was in case management. So what was the reason behind that interruption? And then I'll stop talking. Sorry, I'm raising my hand physically because while I'm sharing my screen, I can't raise my hand on the screen. But anyway, thank you. So Lizzie, what was Louise's question is, what was the reason for that interruption uh, two months, April to June of this year? Thanks, Dr. Natasha. Uh, according to the report, when we looked inside the file, there was no record of, of reason for interruption. The only one that we, we know, according to the retention counselor, is the one that she missed for, for collecting blood. But uh, she never missed after that. So no record indicated inside the file reasons of, of interruption. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to ask, um, so I, I think Louise answered my question about what do people think is happening, that those viral loads are staying high during case management. She was still on TEE um, and then she uh, she was obviously failing because of those repeated interruptions. So her TEE was not working. So then um, can I ask, I'm going to, if no one puts their hand up, I'm going to go to the participant list and I'm going to put someone on the spot. So I'm going to ask uh, which regimen is this client now on with TLD, but is it TLD1 or TLD2? 
Magdalene, your hand is noted. Are you willing to answer that question before your comment? Is this patient TLD1 or TLD2? Please unmute. Thank you, Dr. Natasha. Uh, the, this patient is on TLD1 according to the history because she has, she has she was not on regimen two before she was on regimen one. So for me, it's TLD1. Okay. Yes. And would anyone um, like to, before you go on, hang on, I'm going to pause your thought. Would anyone like to disagree with Maggie on the TLD1? Please raise your hand if you would like to uh, counter argue Maggie's conclusion about TLD1. Natasha, I muted. We can't hear you. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I was asking someone to come come uh, with a counter argument to Sister Maggie for the uh, TLD1. Uh, Josephina, I see you in the chat. You have said it's TLD2. What? Uh, um, can you come off mute and explain why you're saying it's TLD2? Josefina? Uh, Natasha, Josefina's computer. Okay, so Josefina in the chat has said they failed the previous regimen. So that's correct, Josefina. Just remember, everyone, that... Uh, TLD2 is a definition of any previous regimen failure, not based on first or second line, but any previous regimen failure. So this lady has failed TEE and is therefore TLD2. Um, and Tabi Singh, would you like to comment for the participants about why that is important to know in this lady? Now you are on mute. Hi, Natasha, we're having a technological difficulties for different reasons here. Can you repeat your question? Comment on what? I was asking you to comment on why with this lady's history of persistent high VLs and recurrent interruptions, why would you say it's important that we note that she's on TLD2? Uh, I think if then this regimen fails, we need to know when we do a genotype resistance test as to what um the history was if and what she was what other drugs she was exposed to. Yeah, and also just to add to that, that it changes our approach. If she ever rebounds and gets high viral loads again in the future, the way you manage a TLD1 versus a TLD2 is different. But we'll come back to that in session three, which is coming in two weeks. Maggie, you go ahead with your comment now. Thank you. I wanted to clarify on the issue of the two months that we missing from uh April, I think it was May and some part of June. Not that I know about the patient missing in, in time, but what I have seen when auditing files, some notes you would not see them on your dental stationery. Probably if they don't have this dental stationery, they will use part of the note of the results to write notes. So if it's a bigger file like this lady's file, you find it difficult to go through every page because you find the notes behind. Uh, the result, and if you you are not aware of that, you be, you will miss that. So that's what I've seen when auditing files. Some of the notes are some way hiding. So it and it shows that this person this patient never missed appointment ever since she was enrolled on a uh, case management. That means the the um RC should have those visits under her her record. Although we don't see them on the files, but if she can look on her in her record, she might see that this patient did not miss those cases, just that the notes are missing somewhere, but they are somewhere in the file. She can go back and look. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Maggie. That's a good point. So with these patients who have a very long history, sometimes the files can be a little bit messy and there can be handwritten clinical notes plus the tier stationery plus someone in the chat, Josephina mentioned that maybe um, they were, this woman was given a two-month supply. So she was 
uh, she had drugs in hand and came back in June when they switched her, although her date was was due for April because uh, she's obviously had low adherence over time, so she may have um, she may have accumulated drugs in hand. So um, I want to ask a question. I'm gonna I'm gonna put someone on the spot. Let's go because uh, I love the fact that you've all got your videos on. So I'm gonna ask Rusi um, Labano. If you have a patient with a history of six times interruptions plus all these high viral loads, how confident are you that she's going to stay suppressed um, in the coming few months or over the next year? Are you feeling like this case manager will have managed to address all issues and she's now sorted or would you still have some concerns going forward? Please unmute for us. Okay. Uh, I think that's what I was asking myself as well, uh, uh, seated here. But uh, one of the things which I would say in terms of case management, I think we need to have a, a good plan uh, for this uh, particular patient um, in terms of uh, health education, uh, which we need to give uh, to her. And then the other things uh, which we need to rule out also uh, is the patient's own adherence or are they able to self-manage, you know, if we are looking at it? Uh, if uh, we, we have ticks uh, on that and then also looking at um, are they able to attend uh, their scheduled sessions? Are they able to uh, attend a treatment, not come to the clinic? Because one of the things which we need also to take um, cognizance of is the traveling distance uh, to the clinic or means of coming to the clinic. So I think all those things need to come uh, into play because uh, at the end of the day, they, con uh, they build up a conducive environment uh, for a patient uh, to adhere and also uh, to have a better outcome. So I would say um, a good plan, good education, looking at uh, other uh, environmental issues and also their psychosocial uh, state as well. But um, I'm quite confident that uh, if uh, we do all those things, let's say I was the case manager, we will be able to. But as we monitor the patient, I think we'll also get other indicators, which will then tell us whether we're going south or we're making uh, the progress which we desire. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucy. Does anyone else want to, to come in and comment on that from their experiences of, of these patients who've had really ongoing issues over many years? Um, do you feel confident about decanting them? Is that a supportive move for them? Or do you find that they come back in in a few years uh, destabilized again? Uh, how do you weigh up keeping someone strongly supported versus giving them the freedom of the multi-month dispensing? Um, how would you approach that? As, as a clinician with, uh, with these patients, we see these patients often on the ground, right? So maybe Masalana or Nsovu, uh, who are from Sanin Subdistrict, your nurse mentors, if you're sitting with a DOH nurse in the facilities and you've got a patient like this who's gone from unsuppressed, 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 and then hits TLD and is wonderfully suppressed, what is your plan for them? How do you approach it? Hi, Natasha. So uh, I think we would have to consider some of the factors that were mentioned by Babu Vosi uh, drilling into the psychosocial, but we also need to assess uh, the level of um, knowledge and skills from our professionals as well, if they are able to manage such patients, because uh, you might find that previously the patient was not attending the clinic because of distance or because of attitude that is coming from uh, the health clinicians or maybe the case manager did not have enough knowledge on how to properly case manage the patient. So I would um, uh, make sure that I, I, I give 
counseling to that patient and decant them, but also closely monitor them because they are likely to fail the second uh, regimen as well if all the other issues like your psychosocial issues have not been addressed. Uh, we also need to establish uh, psychosocially where the patient is staying, who are they staying with, are they able to take their treatment because yes, now they have suppressed with a TLD, but going forward, will they be able to continue taking their treatment as required to stay suppressed? Thanks. Thanks, thanks for that input. Um, Sina, I see your comment in the chat. Maybe you'd like to come off mute and, and share your experience because I think what you say in the chat is good and it can be hard for everyone to follow the conversation and the chat. So I'm gonna come on and share what you said. If you're able to. You know, Sina's just going to talk on my... Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. Hi, everyone. So um, I think it depends why the client was unsuppressed and the reasons for the poor adherence. It could have been that the client was adherent, but they were not uh, properly managed. I've come across a client where um, they, they kept on being sent for adherence counseling, adherence counseling. Meantime, um, they had drug-to-drug um, uh, -drug interactions that were not addressed. And once that that was addressed, then the client suppressed, and yeah, and it was easy to decant the client. Uh, whereas you have some clients who are non-adherent because of social and psychological problems. That um, once those are addressed and their environment is stable, then they can also be decanted because then um, it, it's easier to 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 for them to remain adherent. And that's why I'm talking about um, you need to assess for risk profile again. It's not like you. Your, your previous risk profile will inform future adherence. So at every visit, you need to assess what the risk profile is and that should be um, used to inform your, your decisions moving forward. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sina. Um, I'm going, Ntabi Singh, I see your hand, I'm coming to you. I just want to ask Lizzie a question as the case presenter. For for um, I'm gonna give you a moment to think about it whilst Ntabi Singh speaks. So for this lady, um, she suppressed very soon after the TLD and was immediately decanted. Can you just have a think about whether that risk profile assessment was done and, and was a, a good process put in place to make sure this lady had the support she needed to stay suppressed, it, being so quickly decanted? And Tabi Singh, go ahead whilst Lizzie has a think about that question. Thanks, Natasha. I think um, the other thing that we need to think about is this patient has been failing this um, the regimen for quite some time, right? I mean, the patient had 11 better loads. So say, for instance, the patient failed in 2018 and four years of repeated better loads that are high and being told that you're not taking medication while you know you're taking medication is disheartening and demotivating. So it might be that for that last four years, the patient was simply not taking because we all stopped believing in her and nothing was happening anyway. So we need now, now that we've changed medication and that the viral load has suppressed, you need to rebuild that relationship with the patient and that trust to say the reason why we believe you, first of all, when you say you were adhering, it was the treatment that was not working. The treatment that we've given you now is working, as you can see, with the viral load. So keep on taking treatment and be motivated. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. I think that's a really important point. When you have patients who are repeatedly non-suppressed and they are telling you that they're taking their treatment, it's a very fine line between not believing them because you think it's an adherence issue um, and, and sort of undermining their trust and them ending up feeling frustrated. And we'll talk about that more um, during the next session, which is about these persistent non-suppressors and, and the different causes for that. But I think it's very good to raise it during this session as well, because it, it is all about building trust. Um, Ninka, is it related to that comment or can I just ask Lizzie about the, okay, Lizzie, can you answer about the, the risk assessment that was done before she was decanted? Did anyone have a conversation with her to make sure it's a good fit for her? 
Thanks, Dr. Natasha. Yes, the before they put a decan to the patient, we do have the risk assessment form that we are using in case management. And as part of the continuous adherence to motivate this patient, whenever they meet the, the patient, they always motivate them that to say, now that you are suppressing because of we also changed this treatment and uh, you will always also be uh, decanted and you'll no longer come to the facility every uh, now and then. So you'll be taking at a place which is near to you. That was part of the motivation. And for the patient, because ever since she started treatment, she was complaining and worried, why is she not uh, suppressing while taking treatment every day? For her to have a suppressed viral load, that was a motivation on itself. And together with the retention counselor, they made arrangement to say, even though she's discounted, they'll still talk to each other. Visual support is still done. So even though she is at the external pickup point, but she's still receiving support from the RC to ensure that she's not uh, going back again. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Lizzie. That's really good to hear that that was that discussion was was uh, undertaken. Ninka, do you want to go ahead? And then I'm just aware of the time. We did start late. We started at 11.46, so we've got five minutes left. Um, I'm going to go ahead with your comment, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, it's okay, Natasha. I think it was covered. Okay. So then I just want to ask one question about the decanting. Does anyone, has anyone noticed a piece of information that is missing before we decanted this patient? We know they're virally suppressed, but what don't we know? So we've had questions in the chat about when the TB was done, but we know the TB treatment was completed. I believe it was completed before she was on TLD. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Lizzie. Um, but we had a discussion earlier about something that was missing. Can anyone comment on that? Put it in the chat if you don't want to speak. So yeah, Zama has put um, TPT in the chat, which I think is a, a good point. Um, she had TB treatment before. We know that people with prior TB are supposed to get a course of TPT. She, so that is, yeah, that's right. And then uh, Maggie, is there something that you want to add? Yes, I also wanted to add on TPT, but also about TB contact. Yeah. We know that's oh, sorry, TB child, contact. But we don't know how old the child is and whether they were tested for TB. Okay. Um, I, so yeah, I think the TB treatment is a bit in the past, uh, if it was recent, but yeah, so we've got a few options in the chat and maybe this could have had a, a, been a poll if we had had time, um, but the thing that's missing is the CD4. If this lady has advanced HIV and we decant her, she's not on Bactrim, we don't know if her CD4 is under 100 and she needs a cryptococcal antigen. Um, she did have a urine lamb, I think that was mentioned, which was indicated because, but oh, actually we don't know if it was indicated because we don't know what her CD4 was. So please, just a reminder, although it's not the primary focus of this session, this session is about how to address a person with adherence challenges. Let's not forget about advanced HIV disease. And if someone has a viral load above a thousand for more than six months, they're supposed to get a CD4 count done. And if they are developing advanced disease, we certainly need to step up our adherence and our clinical support. And I would not recommend decanting someone until we know what their CD4 count is in, in case they're very vulnerable to, to opportunistic infections um, and de clinical deterioration. So that's just a reminder on that. So I really appreciate everyone who's, um, who's taken part in the discussions. For those of you who are maybe a bit nervous to speak, Please don't be. Um, this is this is all. It's the like I said at the beginning. The the motto for Project Echo is all learn, all teach. And the more everyone chips in to the conversation, the more we can learn from each other. Because on this call, we've got fifty people. How many hundreds of years of experience of looking after people with HIV does that add up to? And you've all 
learned your own skills you've all got your own experiences that contribute and and if you don't share maybe we miss out on an opportunity from learning from something that you've picked up so just the take home messages from the um from the case i think is that we would hope now um, with our case managers in place and with capacity building for our clinicians that it would become much less common for us to see a, a, a patient who has six years with non-suppression uh, and that as soon as we see one viral load over 50 copies we're actively going to jump in there and try and do something about it with the case management but as Dr Ntabi Singh said also the clinicians I think there was a tendency for us to leave the adherence work to the case managers, the retention counselors, and the clinicians would sort of just uh, say, oh, they're doing a EAC with the retention counselors. But as clinicians, particularly with these patients who have repeated high BLs, we as clinicians need to have the adherence skills. And Tabi Seng has beautifully laid out all those different barriers. And we need to have a structured approach as to how to um, ask about all of those and have ideas in our heads of ways to overcome them so that these patients can get the support they need. And you've seen from this that with case management alone, it took her two years to resuppress. So the case managers sometimes get stuck and the clinicians need to be there to help them. So positive client uh, clinician relationships with really non non-judgmental approaches that we build trust and then, as Lizzie said, very important, when people do resuppress, lots of positive feedback, lots of encouragement, lots of motivation to say, you've done this, well done, high five. You're gonna get decanted now, but our door is always open if you have challenges again. Don't be scared to tell us if the challenges resurface. Okay, so thank you very much for joining. I hope that all of you who will be presenting in your districts will take time to look over the slides if you're the SME, Take time to prepare the cases um, with your with your district staff. Let's try and get as many DOH people onto the calls as we can and um, keep the focus on the adherence and, and the high BLs. There's lots of other stuff that comes in, but let's keep it um, focused on this high BL stuff as much as we can. Um, and thank you very much for your attendance. We're going to close the meeting now. Please just draw your attention to in the chat. There's the feedback form. We would love to hear from you um, anything uh, that you think could be improved on for next session. And once again, I'd like to apologize for the bit of mess at the beginning. Um, just please let your participants know in your district ones. Uh, encourage them not to join too early so that the hub team can have time to set up host, co-host, polls, screen sharing and everything before the session starts to keep things smooth. Thank you very much and well done. Uh, thank you and Tabi Singh for your inputs to the subject matter, subject matter expert and to Lizzie and Ernest for the case. It was a really interesting case. Lots to learn from and lots to think about. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.